Thanks very much, Chris, uh, and it's great to be here at the Friedman Conference. I don't know if this is my fifth or sixth year, but it's pretty pumped, and it's great to see that it just keeps prospering and succeeding. And for those who are from overseas, welcome, and we hope you have a wonderful time. And, of course, nobody need to explain it to you, but the point of being part of the, the Liberal Party in Australia, particularly from America, is that you're actually supposed to be Liberals, not in the way that the term has been bastardised in the United States to mean spending more and taxing more. But the idea, yes, shame, yes, very good. <laughs> but that you might actually believe in the inherent dignity of the individual, their right to pursue their life, their opportunity, their enterprise. Society should be open. We should encourage people to aspire and to achieve so they can stand on their own two feet to take care of themselves and their families because that's not selfish. It's the best way to make sure you're not a burden on others and to assist others in the process. So in saying that, yes, when we... Took, accepted the invitation to talk about the future of the Liberal Party. There are a lot of people who probably thought the topic's the same, the emphasis is different. <laughs> because when we probably all accepted the invitation, it was because there was an expectation that the party would be defeated at a federal level, that we'd all be talking about where to from here, how do we need to reinvent ourselves, and some people would say we need to go off to the left, some would say we have to go off to the right, uh, and uh, the rest of us would have um, slightly variations on issues and views. And I'm, for those of you just in the VIP session, I'm sorry, you're about to hear a lot of what I said there before, which is the reason we won this election was because, firstly, we focused on mainstream issues, meaning ones that touched on every Australian and how they wanted to live their lives. But the other reason is because we ran as a Liberal Party. I cease, never cease to be amazed the number of times with people who think that um, Liberal Party shouldn't be Liberal because they want them to go on to different directions uh, or different aspirations or different ambitions in the way that if you appease the left, somehow you'll end up in a better place or if you appease people who are more on the right, uh, that somehow you are going to bring a mass a wash of new people through. Because the fundamental reason that we won the election is because the foundations of everything we believe in were instilled in the policy that we projected to the community. And I said before, and I sum it up in one word, which is we respected the public. And when I think about the difference, and this goes back to the point that Hayek made uh, in The Road to Serfdom, the difference between liberalism and all other political philosophies is that liberalism is the only political philosophy anchored in the idea of empowering people and giving people control over their own lives and letting them make decisions for themselves and the privilege and the freedom to take responsibility. Yeah, right, there's lots of institutions and architecture around property rights and everything else, but that's the point. And whether it's socialism, enviro-fascism or every other type of political philosophy or religious fundamentalism, it's all about empowering people like me and Amanda. With all due respect, Amanda, I want you to have less power, not more. <laughs> and, that's, and she's okay with that. That's why she's on this panel and in this audience. Uh, it's all focused on empowering them because they want to achieve noble ambitions because somehow with centralised information or knowledge, you know, we know more or better for you than you know yourselves. And that is the central thrust of what we took to the election. You know better than us. Now, all right, it didn't come out in those words, but when it came to our tax policy, our view was... Money is better in your pocket, not ours. What was our alternative or our opponents? It was give us more money, we know how to run your life or be able to protect you better than you know how to protect yourselves. The same is true in industry where their view was we have grand ambitions about what we can achieve for the economy and if you simply empower us to shut things down, somehow that'll make you better. Where well, we said we're going to back Aussie industry, Aussie jobs and people being able to stand on their own two feet. So at every point, and there's always a tension between those things, because if you want to have a successful government for the whole of a country, you have to find that balance between the individual and government. There does need to be some central power. I know, say shame again, it's fine. <laughs> but it's largely to set up the architecture and the institutions to empower those people to live their lives. And that should be the limitation. Now, I'm not saying that we're uh, as much of a fantasy about that as some people in this room would like. But the more we focus on that, the more you connect to people on an individual level and respect their lives. And that's the foundation, the basis in which you can achieve political success. Because when someone comes along 
and wants to increase their power centrally, it's at your expense. And that's a message and a contact point that we can always fight back against and always sell. And that's where our focus must be. Of course, freedom is a fundamentally critical principle of liberalism or libertarianism or whatever different term you want to use. And it is. But part of the task is always, of course, to do it in a section or in a culture, in a cultural context. And one of the great cultural contexts of Australia is that Australians like the idea of a fair go. And they do. I mean, it's even in our national anthem. And, of course, it was the foundation of the narrative that our political opponents ran. So we do need to be mindful of this. But, again, we have the answers for how we are going to achieve that if we focus on it right. Because the foundation of a fair go is not to give something to people who haven't earned it. The foundation of a fair go is to provide for those who can't take care of themselves because we have a natural compassion for those who can't. But the foundation of a fair go is to create open systems so people can get on with it and be able to stand on their own two feet. And so the more people seek to disempower individuals and families and communities and show no respect, the more they're not giving people a fair go. The more they're not creating a system or a society where people have a sense of justice and purpose about how they're able to live their lives. So the future of the Liberal Party is not to become a pale shade of the Labor Party, and we know that. This was the most important election of our, or my adult life because there was such a clear and stark choice. The stark choice was between whether we are going to be a Liberal democracy or a social democracy. The stark choice for us, though, now is whether we're going to be proud and confident of who we are and what we stand for and not go down rabbit warrens designed because people have faith and they want to impose their will on others or to go around and say because of uh, environmental or social concerns that we can be the, uh, the successful fiddler of the architecture of society uh, and decide how people are going to live their lives either. So the future of the Liberal Party, if it wishes to be successful, is to anchor its purpose in respect for people and to make sure we keep the systems and society open so that people continue to have free choice. Now, there is no perfect science to achieving this. When I hear people say things like we've got to be more conservative or more progressive, they're fundamentally misunderstanding what political philosophy is about. I mean, the idea that you need to be... Cons I always liken it as like you're getting into a car. And this is what this classical... This election was a classic example of that. You get into a car and if you slam your foot on the brake, you go nowhere, and yes, you're being very conservative, but it doesn't necessarily achieve very much as you watch the world go by. If you're too progressive and you slam the foot on the accelerator, it won't take long before you crash and probably take out the car with you. The choice is between the direction... And, of course, what we should want and aspire to do is to drive, if you want to be a mainstream party, you know, Liberal Democrats maybe uh, might have a slightly different view on this, it's to drive at a safe, space, safe pace with a full mind and awareness that sometimes you've got to slow down and brake and sometimes you've got to go forward. But the best way to decide the direction and land yourself in a safe location is to drive sensibly, take people with you, into, including the whole community, because you're mindful of the human impact of where you're trying to go. You know, this election, that's basically what Scott Morrison did. Said we're going to go, for want of a better phrase, to the right or steer to the right, drive at a sensible pace. Sometimes we go a little bit slower, but we also needed to uh, drive the agenda as well so we got safely there. By comparison, Bill Shorten got into the car. The people, the kids in the back, kept shouting, faster, faster, faster. And he went, OK and then took a hard left and unsurprisingly crashed into a tree. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm quite happy about that, so long as there are no human casualties. But it made the choice for the Australian people pretty clear. And that's the embodiment and the spirit that we need to take forward. Sensible, purpose-driven approaches to make sure we empower people and show respect for them. 
Because the more we do that, the more we don't just empower individuals and families and communities that we do, the more we diminish the power and the authority of people like me. And that's a good thing. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm in a bit of a different situation. Uh, some of you may be aware that I, I ran for the, uh, the lower house seat of Lingiari in the Northern Territory for the Country Liberal Party. Uh, the votes are not completely counted. However, it is um, very likely that the incumbent uh, Labor member will remain in that seat. Shame. Shame. <laughs> um, considering he first came to Parliament um, when I was five years old, most certainly shame. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about what the situation is in the, in the Northern Territory. Um, within the Country Liberal Party, within the wider community, and I guess my hopes um, uh, where, where this election for me was such a huge um, learning curve and understanding uh, probably where I needed, to do, I needed to do things better, but also um, the utter failures to be able to bring the bush along with the rest of Australia. Uh, everything that Tim just spoke about, the privilege of being able to stand on one's own feet, to be able to provide for your own family, uh, a lot of those things are just taken for granted by Labor in the Territory. But all of that is what Aboriginal people, the most marginalised Aboriginal people in remote communities do not have, do not understand. And for me, this is about empowering those people to come along with the rest of Australia. Uh, had my people in the bush been much more better informed uh, as to what the choices look like to them, or even knew they had a choice, they too would have been voting like the rest of us in this country. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's criminal in my view that it's not the case and I will explain that further to you all. So currently in the Northern Territory, the CLP, we are not a huge party, we are pretty much a territory party. So on a federal level, it is quite a feat to try and run a federal campaign. I was um, pre-selected in April of last year and I was covering 1.3 million square kilometres, which is the size of my electorate. And within that electorate, there were over 230 remote communities and outstations um, that I had to get to. And in a great deal of those remote communities are, um, are what you'd call gatekeepers, I guess. They are non-Indigenous community members who are predominantly labour, um, who live and work in those communities and who brainwash local Indigenous people in those communities. Now, they could argue that my view is paternalistic, that Aboriginal people can think for themselves, but they would argue that view knowing full well that they take advantage of those people in those communities. So the Country Liberal Party... Um, they like to, they sort of lean more toward um, the nationals and, you know, the nationals take care of um, regional Australia. For me personally, I see myself as more of a liberal. Um, it's made up of hard-working people. They're, they're the small, medium uh, business owners within the Territory. Now, in the, at the moment, our economy is absolutely in ruins. We have a Labor government which is sending us down the drain. It is... Spending, it's, well, it's absolutely spent um, all our, all our um, taxpayer funds and is now cut, having to cut services all over the place um, in order to get by. And, and again, this is criminal. The Territory is suffering right now, which, um, which really I was very surprised to, to see that the seat of Solomon, which is... Darwin, the other lower house seat, went back to the incumbent Labor member. 
And the only reason I can think that this is this happened this way is because Territorians thought that we would end up with a federal Labor government and probably felt as though we'd do better, uh, you know, with a with the Territory Labor um, member as well as a federal, you know, in in the broader aspect. Unfortunately, that's not the case. So now we've got two lower house um, Labor members who will warm their seats for the next three years, basically, uh, which has been done in the seat of Lingiari for over 30 years now. Uh, so we have the we have the hard workers, we have the the business men and women. We also are made up of. Um, um, those who are part of the beef industry, which is the lifeblood of the Northern Territory, uh, cattle station owners. And while, while they make up a huge part of our party, they're also uh, isolated from us. So don't get the opportunity to really participate, um, you, you know, on the political side of things. So, yes, we've, all got, we've got all these wonderful people. Um, we have very little Indigenous people within the party. And that is because... Um, Labor, again, behave as though they own Indigenous people. Shame. 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 They have... Um, and the unions are part of this, of course. Um, when the Wave Hill walk-off walk um, takes place every year, the commemoration for that, the unions bus in and act as though they own Aboriginal people. That's the only time that this small community... Uh, gets to see um, the, the union members in their community. Uh, and and it's, just, it's just incredible to be in these communities and see, you know, the way that the people don't understand that they have a choice. They're not educated enough. They're not informed enough to, to, th to think, well, I could do things differently for once. And this is also culturally based. You know, we have this idea that we've got the world's oldest living culture, we do, but it doesn't mean we have to keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. And, we're, and when we're expecting a different result, of course, we know that this is insanity. But this is what goes on in communities. So part of what I've been trying to do is to educate the rest of Australia and expose the sorts of tactics that go on in remote communities, which is what I did, thank goodness, for Facebook Live throughout the election. Um, and the rest of Australia could see the, the sorts of tactics that Labor deploy in the bush. Where I guess I feel like I have let my own people down is not being able to inform them enough to understand that they have a choice so that they understand what liberalism means and what it could mean for Aboriginal people. When I visit these remote communities, I, there's an overwhelming push to dismantle the land councils because, in my view, it is, it, it is another paternalistic uh, bureaucracy that is controlling Aboriginal land, Aboriginal lives and Aboriginal opportunity to economic development and to wealth and to be, being able to stand on our own two feet. So not only was I up against Labor, but I was up against the land council machines as well. And even though people understand that we need to get rid of them, we need to dismantle them, they simply don't understand how that has to come about. Uh, so while I was out on the remote polling booths, the, the sorts of tactics that Labor deployed was, you know, they would pay several locals on the day to stand there and hand out how to vote, speaking in language, Unfortunately, I landed at the bottom of the ballot and the incumbent was at the top of the ballot. So they encouraged the donkey vote, which is easy to do when people's, you know, third or fourth language is English, their education is not great and they don't, you know, they, they are completely uninformed. They encouraged the donkey ballot. They said, OK, you don't want to get in trouble to vote? We'll simply just go one to six on here. You'll be all right then. You won't get in trouble. They lied to people. They had locals within the booths um, speaking in language and yelling out and telling people to vote for Labor. They had, in one community in Millingimby, they had um, a broadcast on a loudspeaker across the community telling people to vote Labor all day. The unions had sponsored that radio station to do that. 
Uh, myself and my mother were bullied directly by some of the labour union thugs that were out there. They would hand out cigarettes for votes. They would hand out $5 notes for votes. And for a group of people who know nothing more than to live off a handout, they can be easily manipulated and taken advantage of. So my task ahead is to not back down one bit because these people are my family. They, they are people who I have to bury on a regular basis. The last funeral I attended was the Friday before the election. I buried one of my aunts. I went to several, several funerals over the 12 months during my campaign. And this is what I want to put an end to. So for me, I'm, I'm hoping with the backing of the rest of Australia, which I know I have because I've had an incredible outpour of support, is that I can get out there and I can help to educate the most vulnerable. Even if it's just a little bit, even if it's just a plant a seed that will grow so that these people can understand that next time they go to that voting booth, they can actually make that change. And not just for five dollars or for a cigarette on the day, not because all these people within your family have been brainwashed, have been paid to push for labour, but because it's their right as an Australian citizen in this day and age to be able to make an informed decision and a vote based on that informed decision. So for me, it's bittersweet. I thought it would be bittersweet in that I might be sitting in opposition. <laughs> Um, but it's the other way around, which in some ways is great because I know that I can, uh, I have the backing of the coalition behind me. I, I can then now gather the resources that are needed to get out into these communities and, and do what's needed to be done. I can bring other Indigenous people along for the ride with the rest of Australia. And these are all the things that I aim to do going forward. There are members in communities now who have woken up, who have twigged, who want to come along, who want to stand up and represent their people in local territory seats as well. So the seeds are there, they have been planted. And this is my hope for the future of the country Liberal Party and for Liberals is to bring more of the disadvantaged along so they can have what we get to have as well which is the privilege of being able to stand on our own two feet, to have control over our lives and to look after our families. Because it's, it's a basic human right, in, in my view, in such a country that we live in, such a remarkable, wonderful country. Thank you. Look, rather than echo what um, Tim has so well set out, I think is part of the reasons why we managed to get over the line last weekend, I thought I'd say a few things about what I see as the challenge for us ahead um, and some of the things that I hope that people like us who at least, um, you know, from the back bench have the luxury of being able to really carefully scrutinise policy in accordance with values. So um, I'll go from there. The... The two things I think I would like to see from the Liberal Party going into the future are, first, more courage to participate in cultural debates, more willingness to engage in social conversations so that the policies that shape our country are deeply connected to the values of the Liberal Party. Um, I think that's really important and I think that our failure to do so courageously over the last decade or so is part of the reason why we have just come through a period of some significant turbulence. Um, it's also part of the reason why we face such a um, rabid and emboldened left. And unless we confront the reality of the need to participate um, in the social conversation, not only do we uh, fail, fail to be heard because we haven't shown up, but it has economic consequences. If we lose the social conversation, it's only a matter of time before it starts to harm our economy and the lifestyles of individuals. And that is something the Liberal Party is comfortable talking about. 
a lot of this goes really to the trust we have in our institutions. It's, um, I think, pretty uncontroversial to say it's at a record, record low. And if it continues to decline at current rates, within the next six years, less than 10% of Australians will trust democracy. That's a pretty scary thought. Trust in, in democracy and the politicians who are a part of it would be at below 10%. We're not alone in that. People don't trust banks, they don't trust churches, they don't trust a whole lot of traditional institutions that um, were once the kind of bedrock of who we are. Um, now, part of that loss of trust is earned, right? There are some politicians who have behaved badly. There are some banks who have ripped off customers. Um, there are some churches that have abused children and it's all completely unacceptable. But there's more to the story than that, I think. We've got a media and pretty much everybody who's gone through university who have been taught nothing but postmodernism. Um, so they're always looking for power plays, they're always looking for an agenda that's about um, being deeply cynical about people at all times. Um, maybe that reflects the way people interact personally now too. Um, you know, when we don't show up for an appointment or a date we've made with somebody, or when we don't say what we mean, we burn trust. When we don't look out for the people who are around us or have the backs of our colleagues or our friends, we break down the trust we have with our fellow man. And so perhaps that big picture lack of trust also reflects in aggregate our individual conduct. But nevertheless, the fundamentals that have built this nation they're the same values that made Western civilization rise to become the most free and prosperity-giving values that have been known to man yet. They've been under attack for some time, and I think that's got a lot to do with our inability to trust. There's been a real effort among the academic class and the media and the intellectual class um, that flows from it to try and paint Western civilization as little more than just conquering and oppressing other people stripping them of resources, taking away their dignity, um, and then you know, just abandoning them once the wealth is taken. Now, that is a deeply negative way of looking at the contribution of Western civilization, but um, nevertheless, until maybe the last five years, not a lot of effort had been made to spruik its virtues. This supremely negative rewriting of history um, I think underpins the sense of kind of collective guilt that permeates the way we teach history and politics today in many of our universities and schools. So the effectiveness of the effort of by intellectuals to destroy trust in our institutions means that there are now calls for greater regulation and control of them. You know, plenty will call for more regulation of the banks in the light of the Royal Commission. No doubt, once the Aged Care Royal Commission comes out, everyone's going to want you know, another 500 layers of regulation of aged care. Um, there are already more calls for statutory interference with the work of the church. Uh, politicians have more and more transparency and disclosure type requirements. And there's no real evidence that this makes anything better. And in fact, I'd argue it makes it a whole lot worse. Um, an example from Queensland, only a couple of months ago they passed a Human Rights Act, essentially a legislative bill of rights, much like what they have in Victoria. Um, those who cheer it on play upon the notion that it enshrined things that should be above politics, um, as though politicians, who are at the very least accountable from time to time, can't be trusted with them. But by conferring political decisions on the judiciary, who will never have the check of regular elections, we can expect nothing else but the further undermining of the public's trust in the judiciary, because now we're asking them to be the least accountable of politicians. Um, so the guts of it, I think, is this. When we don't trust our institutions, there's calls for more regulation and control. The problem is that those moves inevitably limit our freedom, and they don't deal with the heart of the disappointment that is the core of that loss of trust. I mean, freedom isn't even really that well understood in the population as a whole. And that's a problem because if we don't know why it matters, then we give it away far too cheaply. If you just think of it as a system of obedience to the unenforceable, 
our choice to participate in a social contract to which we're not compelled, then there is a deep link between freedom and self-restraint. Understanding it in this way highlights its link to the Judeo-Christian tradition, where God gave individuals free will so that they had the capacity to choose to honour God. Now, without disrespecting faith or um, other traditions or people who don't really do religion at all, there's no other intellectual tradition that conceives of freedom in this way. It's deeply individualistic and it honours the value and capacity of every person. But popular consciousness at present doesn't really make a distinction between the notion of freedom from, negative freedom, or you know, the idea that we should be free of bad things, like maybe slavery or oppression, or freedom for, the positive freedoms that I think people in this room would care a great deal about. And it's never been harder um, for people who think the way we do to cut through as we try and make the case for positive freedoms like freedom of thought and conscience and belief, freedom of association and speech. And so those dangers to freedom, I think, are both internal and external. The external is fairly obvious from what I've said and from what you no doubt see in your every um, experience. But there's an internal danger too, I think, that is probably harder to articulate and that might be a little more controversial in this room. An internal corruption of freedom, that is freedom that isn't coupled with self-restraint or self-discipline, descends into a kind of permissiveness or licence and that can end up being personally harmful. So when we think of many of the social ills of our time that seem so hard to fix, like problems with addiction or poor mental health or the knock-on problems that come in child safety or intergenerational disadvantage, the internal corruption of freedom has a good deal to do with it. And we need to, I think, invest a lot more in making its case. We're still a land of great opportunity, but unless we deal with this social problem, I think it will continue to undermine outcomes. There is, as much as it might be unfashionable at this point in time, a deep relationship between rights and responsibilities. People like rights for themselves. They feel virtuous when they talk about human rights, even though those who do so kind of tend to care about some rights more than others, um, but they're less keen on responsibilities. Again, unless it is the kind of big picture problem that you can really just ask someone else to deal with, like climate change. You know, please, somebody else, do something about it. Um, while the people who do the bleeding are enjoying in, in, in abundance the fruits of a high electricity, high fuel consumption life. Same people tend to like for people to be taxed highly in order to pay for many initiatives that are for the benefit of other people that are in their judgment worthy. But there's no mutual responsibility. The notion that with the many rights we have comes personal responsibilities that go beyond ourselves. I want to wrap it up by saying that identity politics plays a really important role in all of this, and it's core to the loss of trust. In its search for a power agenda in everything, it badges every human relationship as one between victim and oppressor. So to solve it, it identifies victims of past injustice, usually in past generations rather than in the present time, and elevates them above others in the present, who because now holding that oppressor status are supposed to accept present punishment for past misdeeds. And it's toxic on so many levels. The victim gets this sense of entitlement to elevated status, and when it's not given, it confirms victimhood, and that's deeply disempowering. It breeds resentment in those who are unjustly branded oppressors based on um, history rewritten ungenerously. And it makes our society tribal, about allegiances to groups based on skin colour, sexuality or gender, rather than about the deep things we have in common. And what has always been the strength of Australia is, as Menzies put it, all those years ago, the things that unite Australians are infinitely more important and enduring than the things that divide us. That was true in his time and it is true now. The efforts that have been made by the left to silence what have been talked of a lot in the last week as quiet Australians 
have, I think, started to be heard. There has been, I think, a rising up in the election result, along with a lot of other factors which I wholly acknowledge, um, that there are a lot of people in our community who resent being silenced in favour of this new elite. But most sensible people to this point just haven't wanted the hassle or the cost of the fight with HR or the fight with the tribunal or the Twitter war that will inevitably you know, slander them for eternity. They don't want the social awkwardness or the shame that comes with that kind of confrontation. That's how they became quiet Australians. They put their head down and they minded their own business, got on with looking after their own families or doing their work. But the effect is to create the impression that the identity politics agenda is the norm and to deepen the cycle of silence. So it's my hope that this new parliament and that the Liberal Party in it will grow in its courage to take on identity politics because when it does so, it doesn't just help us to become the best version uh, or the best representatives of our enduring beliefs, but it gives hope and courage to an enormous part of our community that has felt in their heart for a long time that there's something deeply wrong with where our society's been headed, but haven't quite had the words to explain it or the courage to put it forward. Thank you. So I have a presentation because I am an academic. And unlike the politicians on the panel, which are fantastic, <laughs> um, uh, I have to talk to PowerPoint presentations. So my, um, <laughs> my story today is um, uh, less about the future of the Liberal Party specifically, but the future of parties in general. Why do parties exist? Why have they changed as they have over the last couple of decades? And how can we rethink what parties do for the benefit of those parties? So I think we still need political parties. How can we make them better? My argument, the argument that we've been working up, uh, this is joint work with Darcy Allen and Jason Potts and a lot of the, um, some work with Aaron Lane and uh, the RMIT team in blockchain. Parties are platforms. Let me explain what I mean by that. So... Edmund Burke had a simple idea of what a political party was. It was a group of people. He said, a body of men, we would now say folks, a group of folks uh, coming together to, to united to promote a single, single goal, to basically take, take political power. That's a pretty simple idea. It's how we understand political parties today. They're just a group of people in civil society coming together to um, achieve political power. Pretty basic. Problem is, we see a lot of failure in this area. So the first big trend that we see is declining membership. So political parties were really quite significant in the mid 20th century. They have um, very declining membership. Liberals at the moment claim 80,000 members. I'm not sure how much I believe that. But they, even if that's true, they once had 200,000 members. The Labor Party claims 50,000 members. They once had 75,000. But of course, a great deal of their power is based in the union movement, which was much more significant 50 years ago than it is today. That's trend one, massively declining membership. Bear in mind, those are, uh, th that is not relative to population. That is absolute numbers. So the Australian population has grown significantly since then. Second thing, of course, we see is the really significant rise of third parties. Over the last couple of election cycles, we've seen people moving their first preference votes onto minor parties, onto alternative parties. Um, we, we all know what they are, the LDP, One Nation, all these sort of things are challenging the, the, the dominance and power of the, of the major political parties of, of Labor and the coalition. The third trend we see is the rising prominence of um, non-profit organisations in the political system. Um, uh, think tanks have been around, obviously, for a long time in the case of um, uh, Australia, but the think tanks are tending to grow in their membership bases and be doing a lot more of what parties used to do, which I'll explain in a moment. And obviously that's the Institute of Public Affairs, the Centre for Independent Studies, but also Australian Taxpayers Alliance, Liberty Works and so forth. And this election cycle particularly, we've seen a huge debate about GetUp and, and it, how legitimate the GetUp role is in the political system. Um, I live in a marginal seat, Deakin in Melbourne, and I saw more people handing out GetUp than I did the major political parties. This is an interesting and new change, if nothing else. And of course, 
um, uh, some of our friends have set up Advance Australia to try to challenge um, the dominance of GetUp as well. So what we're seeing is a real movement away from these mass-based political parties. Let's try to explain why. Well, here's a really simple explanation. In the early 20th century, <laughs> people used to join political parties to get married. Um, it was a big part of the social life of a more rural community. This is a wonderful picture of the youth, uh, Liberal Youth Club uh, in New South Wales. And, you know, they still exist, don't get me wrong. But for the most part, we've moved away from that as a matchmaking system. Uh, we have that. We have a shame. <laughs> <laughs> and we have that. <laughs> oh. um, so, things have changed. The, liberal pa oh, the, the major parties don't provide that sort of service that they did <laughs> in the previous years. We, we just have better technology. <laughs> All right. A slightly more complicated explanation, I think, is this. So, I think we've seen over the last couple of decades massive increase in consumer choice. So this is a, a, a poor old bloke looking at the sheer volume of choices he can in the lettuce market. So he goes to the supermarket, you see all these types of super, uh, uh, you know, all, all these types of fruits and, um, you know, toothbrushes and toothpaste and all that sort of thing. And I think we're looking and expecting that sort of diversity in our politics as well. We're not used to the idea that you either choose to buy one brand or another brand. We want more niche brands. We want more niche political content, and that's why we see all these alternatives to the major political parties. That's, I think that's a more complicated and more sophisticated explanation. I think that's a big part of it, but I, but I also, I, I, I'm going to go a little bit further than that. I don't think it's just the fact that the um, major political parties aren't very niche. So all is not lost for the major parties in my story. So at the moment we're focusing on um, you know, the, the traditions of Robert Menzies and so forth. I say, throw those traditions away. You need to look at this guy. This guy's name is Jean Tirole. He is a Nobel Prize winner in economics, and he has an argument about two-sided markets, the co idea of platform competition in two-sided markets. This is the major area of economic research that we're working in, and is the major area of economic research at the moment. Because the new economy that we live in is platforms. In the previous economy, the dominant uh, economic form of the 20th century was companies that sold you products. Like a supermarket, you go to the supermarket and you purchase a product off the shelf. So I've got on the left some fairly standard product-based companies in the uh, mid-20th century, BHP Billiton, so companies that sell you oil, sell you significant products, Walmart, of course, Maya, Microsoft was a product-based company. IBM was a product-based company. You go to them and you say, I would like a supercomputer, super and they sell you the one supercomputer that they have. We have moved into a totally different economic environment now where the dominant economic form is platforms. Platforms like Facebook that match us to people that we might make exchanges with. Platforms like Google, platforms like Amazon or Amazon Web Services. Now IBM is a platform company. And the idea, and, and Microsoft now is a platform company. The idea behind a platform company is that it sits in the middle between two different parties making exchanges. So we go and we join these platforms to make exchanges with each other, to communicate with each other through the platforms. But the platforms aren't selling us specific products. Products on one side, platform economies on the other. Parties, in my argument, in our argument, are platforms. Parties match people with other people. They match politically engaged members and motivated people to positions of candidacy. So they will match you to a position in the federal parliament or a candidacy for a position in the federal parliament. And they will match you as a member to the representatives of your political party as well. So they use the Liberal Party brand to make relationships between members, other members, political candidates, representatives, and so forth. This is a radical new way of thinking about the purpose of political parties, and I think it helps us solve some of these dilemmas that we're facing at the moment. So, what do members do? Why would you join a political party? 
This is a rhetorical question. Why on earth would you join a political party? <laughs> um, so obviously, party membership is partly a, a consumption product. So, so you, 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 what do you get from a political party? You know, you, you join up. It's nice to be close to power. It's nice to be influential on the people who are in power. Membership is a big part of your identity. You might describe yourself as a member of um, uh, a liberal or labor. You would say, I'm a liberal as if it's, you know, it's part of your identity. And, of course, you can make personal relationships as well. So that's what members do. But members also govern their parties. Think about exactly what Edmund Burke said right at the start. It's a civil society organisation that comes together to achieve a shared goal. So those members are in charge of the party. They choose the representatives. And most importantly, they monitor whether the representatives are doing a good choice. And they do so subject to all these norms and rules and social obligations. So the second person that I think we need to talk about when we talk about political parties is this fellow, Linus Torvalds. And he would argue, or at least he's argued in the case of the open source software community, that something like a political party is a self-governing platform. It's a group of people coming together to make relationships within the platform itself. So what has happened to the parties? So I've given you an argument about what those political parties have done, how, how, they have, um, uh, 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 how they're declining and how they're failing in some way. But what ha has happened if we look at them through the idea of a platform? Well, the matching, uh, the matching function is uh, de decreasingly ineffective. So the big parties, Liberal and Labor, the Nationals, even to some extent the uh, Greens as well, are being outcompeted by little platforms. So because we've discovered that it's better to match on a narrow platform, it's better to match on, so for instance, the LDP, or it's more attractive from a consumption perspective to match on the LDP platform or the One Nation platform than it is on these big dominant hegemonic political parties. I think that's because the parties are not acting as they should be. They're acting as if they just sell their members a product. They're acting like supermarkets, not like Facebook or Amazon or something like that. They're acting as if their product is a one-sided take it or leave it. If you join the Liberal Party, you get the Liberal package. You don't get to influence the Liberal package. You don't get to make specific relationships within the Liberal package. You just have to take the Liberal package. It's a take it or leave it situation. I think they need to think themselves more like platforms. The political parties, at least the major political parties, are acting like hierarchies. They tell the members that this is what has been decided, not what should we decide. And more, most fundamentally, the relationship between the politicians and the political party members is, I, I, I use this terrible phrase here, poorly contracted. The members have very little power over their representatives, but the representatives sort of can just say, oh, yeah, well, thanks for your input, and we'll move on. That is not how a, an effective economic platform relationship would work. And I think, I think that's a lot of the reason that people are unset, upset and unhappy by major party membership at the moment. So what should be done? I think self, a, thinking of a political party as a self-governing platform makes for a very different political party rather than this product party. Political parties should actively encourage niche matches. They should actively encourage people to make relationships within the party that is not entirely controlled by that dominant party. So the most important thing, if you run a platform company, you have to keep people on the platform. Your power, your economic influence, your profit is entirely based on people staying members. Not many major political parties think about it this way at the moment. So. I've got a couple of pieces of advice. I think political parties should actively and intentionally foster the um, development of overlapping sub-organisations. Let's call them factions within the parties themselves. So, for instance, uh, you could have a free speech group in the Liberal Party. You could have a supporters of Israel group. You could have a dry economics group. You could have a not very sure about economic freedom group. You could have all these sorts of groups <laughs> within the individual party because you've got to keep them on the platform. Whatever happens, keep them on the platform. Without staying on the platform, you have no influence over them. You have no capacity to um, keep them uh, in power. Now, my other argument is that you should reduce party discipline as well. You should make the platform more free, more open. It should be more neutral, if you will. Now, there is a trade-off here. They're going to be your, your platform, your party, is going to be less effective in parliament. But, well, pick your poison. It's either decline because people don't want your services or um, reduce party discipline and potentially lose 
some marginal parliamentary ineffectiveness. And the third piece of advice and the most important piece of advice is this. And I know there's a big debate about party governance at the moment. But party governance and party membership are precisely the same thing. These are community groups. These are groups of people freely coming together because they are interested in engaging the political system for the better. You should be encouraging that. You should be encouraging their participation in those groups. And if you are able to do so, if the major parties are able to do so, they will, be, they will flourish in a way that they have not done so since the mid-20th century. Thank you very much. <laughs>